The horrifying and sorrowful tale commences in a typical day in Japan's urban center. While the populace go about their daily routines, an immense black hole materializes abruptly in the middle of a street, pulling in multiple individuals. Concurrently, gargantuan creatures emerge, wreaking havoc on human existence and annihilating any animate entity that crosses their path. As the days pass, the black hole expands, impeding rescuers, military personnel, and other services from accessing it to save those in peril. Those in proximity to the gaping hole realize that it connects to an entirely different and dreadful realm. Furthermore, the occurrence was not limited to that city, as numerous holes emerged concurrently in countless cities worldwide. The world had descended into a veritable inferno, and just as all hope appeared to be lost, the holes materialized. From these holes emerged metahumans, individuals with unimaginable powers, classified into different categories. The immortals were those impervious to death, even in the face of grievous injuries. Then there were shapeshifters, capable of transforming into deadly beasts from the animal kingdom. Finally, there were the ordinary people who wielded spells and dark magic. These warriors emerged to defend humanity, and soon, peace was restored. However, the year of their arrival was forever etched in history as a time of terror and became known as the Terrible Year, a memory that would never fade. As time passed, however, these special beings began to be feared by humans. The rift between humans and metahumans deepened due to a pernicious rumor that spread through the populace. It was said that metahumans possessed dangerous molecules that posed a severe threat to humans. This led to the human metagroup fracturing. The immortals aligned themselves with the government, while the shifters conspired with a global corporation. Eventually, they established their own organization, vanishing into the shadows. Fast forward 29 years, and we are introduced to our protagonist, Gek. While shopping with his father, his father reveals a secret, that Gek has the power of an immortal running through his veins. As it turns out, his father is a metahuman with such abilities. As a result, Gek is expected to possess these powers too. His father reveals that they will awaken on Gek's 24th birthday, precisely at 11 p.m., as that is the time he was born. However, his father warns him not to tell his mother, as it may lead to their divorce. His father notices that Gek appears stronger than before, effortlessly carrying the heavy shopping bags. He assumes that Gek must have been attending the gym, but in reality, Gek spends most of his time at home sleeping and doing homework, not engaging in any physical training. When they arrive home, Gek's parents become affectionate towards each other, and another secret is revealed, Gek's mother is a shapeshifter. As a result, the main character possesses incredible strength due to his mother's shapeshifting abilities. However, she urges him to keep their secret, leaving Gek to contemplate his parents' love for each other but also their fear of being discovered as metahumans. On Gek's birthday, his parents ask him if he wants a special gift, but he declines, expressing his gratitude for having them as the best gift. His proud parents are moved to tears by his words. As night falls, Gek becomes nervous, waiting for 11 p.m. He recalls his father's words about the symptoms he will experience when he obtains the power of an immortal. Firstly, he will feel very cold, followed by heightened senses, and finally, a surge of heat throughout his body. As the transformation process begins, the pain that the protagonist experiences is excruciating. However, he manages to endure it and obtains the powers of an immortal. Along with his newfound strength, his senses become even sharper. However, he still has to deal with the shapeshifter's sensitivity to loud sounds, as the slightest noise can be bothersome. Humanity is currently afraid of abnormal people, which is why the protagonist wonders if he can keep his Medi's identity hidden. Despite his concerns, he decides to go out to eat with his family. During the meal, he notices that everyone eats an unusual amount of food, and only the metahumans seem to have that ability. The fact that their parents have been together for so long and still don't notice this detail strikes him as odd. Later, the protagonist's father brings up the idea of him taking the civil service exam. However, his mother disagrees and wants him to have a normal life, attend university, and get a good job in a company. This disagreement surprises the protagonist, and he remembers what his mother had explained to him about shapeshifters and their desire for a normal life. In the past, Gu's mother had explained to him that daily exercise is crucial for shapeshifters. It helps them control their animal instincts, which can be dangerous if not kept in check. Even when they manage to control it, there might still be moments when they lose their minds. Therefore, she wants her son to focus on studying and working to prevent such situations from happening. She even suggests that his grandfather could help him get a good job in a big company. Back to the present, Gu's parents let him decide for himself what he wants to do. He expresses his desire to join the UDTA military force, but his mother strongly opposes the idea. She fears that being in such a unit would increase the likelihood of his powers being exposed. Despite not intending to take the civil service exam, Gu decides to do so as he sees it as the only way to pursue his dream of joining the UDTA military force. His father supports him and arranges for private training sessions with an old acquaintance. However, Gu's mother is against it as she fears that his powers will be exposed. To prepare for the exam, Gu studies hard and on the way, he comes across news about a white hole which is said to be the main entrance to another world. This other world is filled with valuable resources such as new metals, plants, and animals. 
However, that area is infested with monsters that emerge from the black hole, and only metahumans, specifically shapeshifters, possess the strength to fight there. The protagonist's father contacts a soldier and urges him not to go easy on his son, to teach him strictly. When they meet, the soldier is surprised by the protagonist's physique, as immortals don't usually have enormous strength or muscle mass. The soldier speculates that it may be due to mixed blood, as the protagonist's mother also has thick blood. This statement leaves the protagonist intrigued, as he never revealed that his mother is a shapeshifter. As they venture deep into the forest, they arrive at a field where the protagonist, intrigued and somewhat scared, asks the soldier what he intends to teach him. The man noticed a small cut on the protagonist and pointed out the importance of prioritizing the healing of the body as an immortal. He also explained that the senses should be the second priority, as weak senses can lead to unbearable pain and loss of consciousness during combat. The protagonist was still confused about his training and expected a paper and pencil exam rather than deadly traps. The man clarified that such training was necessary to join the special forces, as a soldier and an immortal must be ready for any contingency. The protagonist is hesitant and scared but ultimately decides to trust the soldier's judgment. He runs towards the blades, intentionally being cut multiple times. Although the pain is excruciating, he notices that his wounds are healing faster than before. The soldier commends his progress but warns him that he must continue to push himself to his limits to master his abilities fully. The protagonist continues to make his way through the blades, cutting himself repeatedly. Wonk asks him how long he should keep doing this, to which the soldier replies that he should continue until the shock awakens. This will help him increase his pain threshold and prevent him from feeling pain. When the protagonist expresses annoyance at this painful training, he asks if there's another way to pass. The soldier responds that if he crosses the 50 meters of blades in 6 seconds or less, he will pass the training. Despite feeling surprised, the determined protagonist accepts the challenge and successfully crosses the blades in under 6 seconds, impressing the soldier. The second training begins, where Guan is instructed to put on a necklace that will strangle him for 5 minutes. He must hold his breath during this time, which is essential for an immortal. The protagonist is instructed by the trainer to endure the pain caused by the activated collar for five minutes in order to pass the test. Despite feeling extreme pain, the protagonist is determined to endure it. However, the collar continues to cause pain even after the five minutes have passed. The protagonist tries to remove it, but the trainer stops him and warns him of the danger of doing so. As time goes by, the trainer becomes increasingly concerned as more than 12 minutes have passed and the collar is still active. Just when Guan is at his limit, the caller finally stops and the trainer is left puzzled about the malfunction. The protagonist shattered the Amor world record, but to avoid drawing attention, he decides to fabricate a story. However, he notices a rare expression of excitement on his trainer's face, who then treats him to a meal that can only be described as demonic. When the protagonist returns home, he tries to call his father, but remembers that his phone was confiscated during training. Back at home, the darkness becomes a test for him, but he manages to sleep with ease due to his well-developed sense of touch. Next, the soldier orders Guan to climb a tall tree and jump from it. Guan is scared, but he trusts the soldier and climbs up. Once he reaches the top, he hesitates for a moment but jumps down, crashing into the ground. He feels immense pain but quickly realizes that his bones are healing rapidly. The soldier tells him that he must learn to control his fear and pain to become an excellent soldier. Despite the intense training, Guan feels a sense of accomplishment and excitement for the first time. He realizes that being an immortal and a shapeshifter is a gift that he must learn to control and use for the greater good. After days of training, the protagonist finally returns home and calls his father to complain about how close he came to death during training. After arriving at the hidden location, the protagonist discovers that his mother had deceived him yet again. Instead of resting, he is expected to train his physical abilities and master the art of shape-shifting. His mother had hired a teacher to assist him in his training. The trainer gives the protagonist some measuring devices to track his heart rate during his first training, which involves running. However, the protagonist's weak heart rate reveals his laziness. The trainer emphasizes the importance of cardio for shape-shifting and the protagonist continues running for 14 hours. The trainer also teaches him stretches to improve his flexibility, explaining that a lack of flexibility can be a disadvantage. As the protagonist begins to feel out of breath, he remembers his training on the hill and how his previous teacher warned him that blocking his senses was not enough. The protagonist realizes that if he weakens one sense, his movement would be disastrous. His previous teacher had warned him that simply blocking one sense was not enough, and that he needed to develop the ability to multitask with his senses. With this in mind, the protagonist begins to time himself as he runs while simultaneously memorizing the stretches from the video, and listening attentively to his current teacher's explanations. After completing 24 hours of running without rest, the protagonist moves on to the second test, which involves stretching. His teacher demonstrates a series of stretches and then instructs him to try them himself. However, the protagonist finds it difficult to perform the stretches, and his teacher advises him not to push himself too hard. She explains that flexibility requires time and patience and that muscles must be gradually torn in order to achieve greater flexibility. 
At this point, the protagonist recalls that he is an immortal and that he can quickly recover from muscle injuries, so he is not afraid of pushing himself to the limit. They both head out for a meal to replenish their energy. Aware that the main character hadn't eaten for over a day, the instructor warns him that wasting food will result in expulsion. However, the protagonist ensures that not a morsel is left on his plate. Subsequently, he retires for the night. The protagonist decides to phone his mother and share updates on his training. Instead of expressing concern for her son's well-being, she seems more preoccupied with the leniency of his coach. As the protagonist continues his training, he recognizes that the shapeshifter routines are designed to push him beyond his limits. Furthermore, he notices the integration of science in the training methods, as evidenced by the extensive use of electronic devices throughout the exercises. Noticing the protagonist's weak reflexes, his instructor challenges him to lift a 60-kilogram weight, which proves to be no issue for the main character. However, the true test emerges when he is instructed to traverse a light board while carrying the weight, maintaining perfect equilibrium without falling. Should he sprint at a rapid pace due to the burden, his muscles could be strained. Nevertheless, given the protagonist's regenerative capabilities akin to immortals, this concern doesn't faze him. He swiftly crosses to the other side without any complications. Witnessing this feat, the astonished instructor has him repeat the task several times. Following that, the challenge escalates further as the protagonist must now traverse a rope without any weight, while maintaining impeccable balance as he runs across it. Initially, this task appears daunting, but with the precision of the immortals, he accomplishes it with ease. The next day, his mother arrives to check on him, explaining that she enrolled him in this training program to ensure he can defend himself against any potential bullies at university. This revelation leaves the protagonist contemplating the possibility of joining the UDT. Once at home, after having a substantial meal, his mother advises him to diligently continue his training. She warns that if he neglects his regimen, he might lose his physique and become significantly overweight, as even metahumans are susceptible to obesity. The protagonist starts pondering the grueling training that might await him in the upcoming week with his instructor. In a shift of scenes, we see the main character repeatedly leaping off a cliff, as his teacher had informed him that the previous sessions were merely basic training for an immortal. Despite this, the protagonist feels content with the pace of the training as it progresses swiftly. His instructor emphasizes that immortals should exercise caution around weapons, such as sharp swords, because although they can regenerate lost limbs, the process is quite time-consuming. Consequently, a new phase of training commences where the protagonist must evade all of his teacher's attacks. Although he sustains multiple injuries, he is able to regenerate them with ease, prompting his instructor to intensify the combat level rapidly. During a momentary lapse in focus, the protagonist suffers a lethal attack to his body. As a result, he must now learn to regenerate his internal tissues, a painful but essential skill for a metahuman like him. He inquires how his instructor managed to launch the surprise attack. The teacher explains that it was due to energy control, which involves concealing one's body energy to become virtually undetectable, akin to a ghost. The protagonist then sets out to master this technique. Meanwhile, his instructor shapeshifts and fires multiple shots at him, since a shapeshifter's significant vulnerability is being shot, as they cannot regenerate from such injuries. This forces the protagonist to hone his agility and movement while incorporating shooting and rope training. Initially, this combination proves challenging for the protagonist, but he quickly adapts without any issues. Gradually, the protagonist comes to understand that his instructors are not training him to fight, but rather to survive in any situation he might encounter. He also learns that immortals need to exercise caution around weapons like knives, while shapeshifters should be wary of firearms. During his training, he experiences an ability called Wild Blood Lust, which invokes a sense of intense intimidation in the opponent, as though they were facing a predator. His instructor informs him that they will use this technique in his training to help him become accustomed to its effects. As days pass, the soldier begins to teach the protagonist how to wield conventional weapons within the context of martial arts. Thanks to his shapeshifter physique and reflexes, the protagonist quickly picks up these new skills. Meanwhile, his instructor teaches him how to handle firearms, emphasizing the importance of utilizing his senses. The protagonist starts going to the gym as he has grown accustomed to the training. His parents commend him for taking care of his physique, which brings them joy. Catching a glimpse of himself in the mirror, the protagonist wonders why he doesn't have a girlfriend. At that moment, his mother informs her husband that she's going to visit a friend. Upon exiting the bathroom, the protagonist receives a message from his mother, reminding him to prepare for a significant exam the following day. This triggers a memory of his friends questioning why he wasn't planning to attend university. In a flashback, the protagonist recalls an event from nine years prior, when a black hole appeared and he found himself trapped amidst the debris of a collapsed building. At that moment, he witnessed someone courageously fighting the monsters, which inspired him to emulate that bravery. However, he knew that sharing this aspiration with his mother would upset her. Meanwhile, the mother meets with the instructor, who inquires if she is curious about her son's progress. She responds that her primary concern is for him to succeed as a matizo, as they possess only half the abilities of their offspring. 
This belief stems from the fact that she considers Joanna to be part human and part shapeshifter. The mother's primary motivation was for her son to be capable of defending himself against rogue scientists. There have been instances where such scientists attempted to combine various special species to create powerful specimens for battle, but these efforts often failed. The resulting offspring, known as irregulars, occurred when a special species mated with a human, which only served to dilute the special specimen's bloodline. The instructor reassures the mother that her son is fortunate, as Joanna is not only highly skilled and intelligent but has also mastered the wild blood lust technique, which surprises the mother. Concurrently, the father converses with a friend who informs him that his son is an irregular. Worried that Joanna's mixed heritage might render him weak, the father is relieved to learn from his friend that Joanna is actually quite talented and has even been taught to conceal his energy. Both parents simultaneously confront the teachers, warning them of consequences if they are lying. The teachers assure the parents that their son is indeed exceptional, which leaves the parents proud and delighted. The following day, as the protagonist heads out for his exam, he listens to music and sings along, unintentionally catching the attention of a girl named Jimmy, who hears him singing. Jimmy playfully tells the protagonist to stop singing, suggesting that with his appearance, he could easily find a girlfriend. As their conversation continues, the two grow increasingly fond of each other. Eventually, they part ways, and the protagonist reaches his destination, where he is guided to the ninth floor. Apprehensive about the nature of the exam, he hesitates but ultimately gathers the courage to enter the room. To his surprise, he is the first to arrive. The bald instructor requests his documents, and once the protagonist is seated, he remains vigilant, anticipating an attack at any moment due to the nature of the immortal exam. However, when the other examinees arrive, he is taken aback to discover that the exam will be conducted in a different manner than he initially expected. The bald professor inquires if anyone needs a pen, prompting the protagonist to raise his hand. This causes the professor to regard the main character as foolish for not bringing a pen to an exam. The protagonist starts to question the purpose of his intense training if he ultimately needed to take a written test. As he observes his fellow examinees, he wonders about their areas of study. Suddenly, walls emerge to separate each student, preventing cheating. Soon, the exam commences, and the first question asks, what would you do if you received a coin-sized puncture wound in your leg? Recalling his instructor's advice, the protagonist selects the answer, apply pressure. The second question requires him to choose the percentage of blood loss that would trigger shock. The protagonist faces difficulty with this question, as he has never personally experienced such a situation. However, using logic and knowledge of other immortals, he chooses the answer, 15 minus 20%. He proceeds to answer all the questions and realizes that the training he received from his instructor was indeed relevant to the exam. Upon turning the page, he encounters a final question asking how to kill an immortal. Confidently, Joanna answers the question and completes the exam. As he exits the examination room, he encounters a girl who asks him to sign an agreement stating that he will be arrested if he breaches its terms. Aware that he is a matizo, she wishes him good luck on passing the test. Later that night, the bald instructor reviews the exams and is astonished by the protagonist's response to the last question concerning the elimination of an immortal, as he had listed multiple ways to achieve this. The question was not about actually killing an immortal, but rather identifying the ways in which they could die if they were not cautious. The bald instructor had heard that Guan was part human and part immortal, which meant he might not be as strong. However, Guan's intellect proved to be valuable, as evidenced by his performance on the exam. After 15 days, Guan receives a message informing him that he has passed the exam, securing first place. His proud parents celebrate the achievement with a meal, and his father advises him to be prepared, as he will soon receive a job offer. Quanic, curious about why the government needs immortals, wonders if they are employed as civil servants. He has many questions for his father but knows they will likely remain unanswered. The following day, Joanne prepares for his job interview. He asks his father several questions about the interview, but his father admits that he doesn't know anything. Left with no other choice, Joanne readies himself for the interview. After a few hours, he arrives at the interview room and observes that everyone is making an effort to secure the job. He then notices the guy who sat next to him during the exam. Upon seeing the protagonist, the guy averts his gaze, as if looking down on Joanne. After a lengthy wait, Joanne is called for his interview. As he enters the room, he is surprised to see the girl who encouraged him during the exam. She is one of the interviewers. The girl starts the interview by asking Joanne about his reasons for wanting the job. Joanne explains that he wanted to push himself to the limit by taking on the challenging exam and also pursue his dream of fighting for his country and its people. The redhead interviewer asks him what he would do if he had only one bullet but needed to shoot two objects. Joanne responds that he would shoot one and then throw the gun at the other. After the interview concludes, more than a week passes by, during which Joanne's mother cautions him to be mindful of his instincts. If he allows them to take over, there could be consequences. In a change of scenes, it is revealed that Joanne has been accepted for the job. However, before officially starting, he must undergo five weeks of training and familiarize himself with all aspects of the position. 
Joanne contemplates leaving the military to become an immortal government worker and wants to share this with his mother. However, the girl, aware that his mother is supposedly human, warns him that if he reveals this information to her, he could face arrest. As a result, he decides not to disclose his plans. Instead, he tells his mother that he wants to become the head of the Ministry of Public Administration, essentially working for the government. Unable to do anything about her son's decision, his mother accepts it and congratulates him. At that moment, Joanne recalls that shapeshifters and immortals often cause chaos because they struggle to control their issues. However, Joanne is unique in that both his instincts and heightened senses are normal, ensuring that he won't create disorder. The following day, a bus arrives to take Joanne to the location where he will undergo his five weeks of training. As he boards the bus, he can identify who is a pure-blood immortal and who is not, thanks to his advanced senses. He listens to the other passengers talking and is surprised by how quickly they form friendships. At that moment, he recalls his father's advice to make friends while working. With that in mind, Joanne decides to initiate a conversation with the handsome boy who seems to look at him with disdain. However, when he speaks to the boy, it turns out the boy barely remembers who Joanne is. Undeterred, Joanne chooses to speak to the girl sitting behind him and strikes up a conversation, aware that he is a maze. She calls him immature, thinking he only chose the job for the benefits and doesn't even know where they are taking him. This irritates the protagonist, but he still wants to continue talking. Therefore, he asks who she is, and the girl tells him that he has zero observational skills, as he hasn't realized she is a pure-blood immortal and is annoyed by the noise they are making at that moment. They decide to keep quiet, but Gu, still annoyed with her, decides to take revenge by releasing gas, which bothers the girl's sensitive nose. After an hour-long journey, they arrive at their destination, where they meet two others, Joan and Gidai. Seeing Quick's confusion, they explain that they are headed to a training field. As they run to get there quickly, Quick realizes that his new teammates are in poor physical condition. Upon reaching the instructors, he is surprised to recognize the bald man from the exam, as well as the two people who conducted his interview. The bald instructor expresses his disappointment in the trainees for becoming tired so easily and orders them to continue running. Joanne chooses to approach the training with caution, aiming for 14th place, as his mother had warned him against revealing that he is a shapeshifter, since humans view shapeshifters as criminals. As they move on to the second part of the training, which involves doing push-ups, the bald instructor tells them to stop, clearly disappointed in their physical abilities. When one of the trainees insults him, the instructor gives the trainee the choice of either leaving the program or accepting a punishment. The boy accepts the punishment, and Guan is shocked to hear the sound of an arm breaking. Indeed, the instructors broke the boy's arm, but they also taunt him loudly. The bald man warns them that breaking the rules will result in a similar punishment. He will be responsible for training their strength, aiming to improve their regeneration abilities to a suitable level for their work. A woman appears, serving as their technique instructor, and the redhead will teach them how to control their immortal bodies. The instructors assign ten people to share a single room, making Gek both happy to be with two friends and annoyed by their rudeness. The group decides to establish rules for peaceful coexistence, and they all turn to Gek, advising him to maintain hygiene since he had released gas earlier. During a meal, an instructor orders each room to choose a leader. The girl suggests that the rude boy should be the leader, but Guan argues that the leader should be someone who can unite the group. The girl claims that the person with the highest purity of immortal blood should be the leader, so most people disregard Joan's opinion. After dinner, the instructors provide them with some equipment, and night falls quickly. However, before they can rest, they must undergo a brief training session. A screen appears before them, and an instructor explains that they are at a telecommunications company supported by the government. Although they appear to be civil servants, they are truly working for the nation. The instructor emphasizes the importance of rigorous training to avoid death and hints at the bald man's purpose, to teach them to use their immortal powers effectively. As they lay in bed, they struggle to sleep due to their sensitive ears and the noise made by others. Juan proposes to make everyone fall asleep, and the blonde girl reluctantly agrees to help. Juan seizes the opportunity to exact revenge and delivers a solid blow to her. He offers to help the blonde man sleep as well, but the man declines, resulting in a sleepless night for him. The first training period begins with the bald man instructing them to run, aiming to improve their physical fitness. Ifu leads the second training period, teaching them hand-to-hand -hand combat. Guan impressively knocks out his opponent with a single strike. The third training period begins with the redhead instructor, who has them run through blades that are three centimeters long. Guan manages to complete the task, but pretends his feet are in pain. A week into their stay in the room, Guan encounters a tense atmosphere. Joan informs him that the bad boy, unable to sleep, left the room and got into a fight with boys from another room, defeating them. Soon, a group of menacing-looking individuals appears, seeking Guan. It seems that Guan is now in trouble due to his troublesome roommate. Another student approaches Yu Quang Ik, requesting that he be knocked out, as people sleep soundly following his punches. Yu Quang wonders how the word got out, but he learns that gossip has spread far and wide. 
Quine is questioned about his dream technique on a night when the first team asked, he struck each of them on the neck, saying, may you dream of me. The next day, the first team leader thanked Quine at breakfast for the heavenly dream. Practice commences, and the coach shows no mercy. Yu Quang Ik notices a worn-out kid trailing behind him, exhausted from running. Quine inquires if he's alright, to which the kid says he's fine and to keep going. In conversation, the overweight kid seems ready to quit, but Quine remembers the Korean manga crown rush, and the quote, become a man who never gives up. Quan tells the kid that if he intended to give up, he shouldn't have started, and that Quan will help him finish. Together, they run towards the finish line as Quan encourages the kid to regulate his breathing. Sadly, time runs out, and they don't cross the finish line. Both receive a penalty of five points. Quan reassures the kid, saying they'll complete the task tomorrow. The kid asks Quan why he helped him. Quan believes that helping someone who's fallen due to helplessness or started drowning doesn't require a reason, as the person would likely feel the same. Thus, Quan doesn't need a reason either. In the locker room, the guys discuss putting the first team to sleep again using the special technique. Quang questions his friend about Gui T. Hyun's sour mood. Apparently, Gui found Wu Mai Ho's lost wallet in the cafeteria and tried to return it to her, hoping to meet her, but she brushed him off. Gui has been upset since. Yu Quang attempts to cheer Gui up but realizes he's hopelessly in love. As Quang leaves the locker room, he encounters the fifth team, who requests to be knocked out for sleep. To execute the perfect knockout, Quang has to adjust his strength based on the person's physical state. Over time, he masters this skill, and people line up nightly for a good night's sleep after a tough day. Insomnia unites everyone, and the instructors seem unfazed by the situation. Most guys enter the dream world through Quan's technique, and he gains fame and the nickname Neck Quan. Eventually, their training nears completion. During his training and alien-related lessons, Quan gains significant knowledge. HVARM, a division of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Security, was an organization whose members infiltrated black holes or eliminated aliens that emerged from them. Although the situation was relatively calm, the potential for monster attacks remained, necessitating the presence of those who could fight, like H. Varum. Quan wondered why his father had sent him to the training camp. As the orientation neared its midpoint, Quan encountered new elements at the training camp. First, there were lectures about aliens given by a boomer instructor. Second, Nuna's lectures, alongside care, informed students about tools that could aid immortals in combat. Nuna taught the students about a combat potion called BB-8. In critical situations, this potion could be injected directly into the bloodstream for an instant effect. However, excessive use could lead to addiction, even for immortals, and overdose would result in lifelong withdrawal symptoms. Lastly, the candlestick instructor provided weapon training. This was followed by a return to running, strength training, martial arts training, and body conditioning. Quan continued assisting the chubby man in his self-improvement, and others joined in as well. As the trainees adapted to their daily routines, Quan sent fewer people into the realm of Morpheus. Their stamina improved, making the morning runs much more manageable. Eventually, even the chubby man could complete the run independently. A month passed, and the training came to an end. No one dropped out due to penalty points, so all were accepted as HVARM trainees. The orientation results, which considered both the training process and written exam scores, determined the final rankings. Monetary rewards were given to the top three, Kai Hyoman placed third, Yung Gi Nam second, and Wu Mai Ho first. After the awards, Quan and his friends planned a celebratory feast. Quan contemplated the many friendships he had formed while heading to the grocery store. As they sat in the barracks, chatting amongst themselves, a stranger entered. Introducing himself as Nam Myung Jin, the director of H. Farum, he greeted the group. Quang was already somewhat familiar with Nam Myung Jin, having read about him before. Nam Myung Jin was born in 1973, served on the emergency operations team for around eight years, and was a first-generation immortal. He was one of the ten immortals that made up the Korean branch of the current old force. Nam Myung inquired about the trainees' experiences, asking if their training was challenging and so forth. He then personally thanked each of the top three winners. Calling Quan forward and referring to him as a half-breed, Nam Myung assured him that it wasn't a bad thing and that he expected to see Quan at work in his office. Nam Myung left a gift for the cadets, which they initially assumed was alcohol. Upon opening it, they discovered it was actually blunt, a mind-altering cocktail for immortals that dulled the senses and caused lethargy. This drink could even put an insomniac immortal to sleep. There were ten jars in the box, one for each cadet. John Gi Nam tossed the jar to the floor, falling asleep without consuming it. Kai Ho Min approached Quan, thanked him for his help, and handed him a note. The note revealed that Principal H. Wallam had a habit of observing certain applicants and testing them. Those who passed his test could receive privileges, but those who failed to meet his expectations wouldn't enjoy an easy life at the company. All the boys drank the blunt in one gulp and passed out. The first day of work finally arrived, and Quan found himself assigned to the third external security team. A short eyed red-haired girl greeted him as his handler, handing him a list of high-ranking HVARM members to memorize by the following day. She explained Quan's job duties before leaving. Later, Quan joined his friends for lunch and asked about their work experiences. Jiang Gi told Quan that he heard director Nam Myung had personally intervened in Quan's assignment. 
The director was known for considering applicants' department preferences, so it wasn't the first time he had involved himself in human resources decisions. The issue lay in Quan's department, the third external security team from the dispatch headquarters. The team consisted of the best of the best, but it also had a notorious reputation for eliminating trainees who failed to fulfill their duties. Quan's supervisor was well known and even had a nickname, The Butcher. In addition to him, there was a man who resembled a panda and acted as the company's control tower. The third individual was Kim Jonah, a superhuman created through the use of secret drugs that granted him forbidden powers. These drugs were the result of government experiments involving magic and alchemy, though the number of human subjects used during those experiments remained undisclosed. Kim Jonah was nicknamed the knife because she would cut before the boss even arrived. While discussing this, Kim Jonah entered and angrily told Quan that he was supposed to study the list, not pry into his co-workers' backgrounds. A cook served the group food on the house. At work, Quan mistakenly addressed the head of the first support team department by the wrong name, causing everyone in the office to be annoyed by his absurdity. Despite his blunders, Quan's reputation as a sleeper allowed him to get to know his team members better. Lee Chumbung was a pure-blood leader who excelled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, making him the best in HRM. Leading Hoon, a half-breed assistant, was skilled in both shooting and hand-to-hand -hand combat, serving as a control tower in tense situations. However, he was also quite annoying, having chosen to focus on more intellectual pursuits since he wasn't particularly talented at fighting. Jonah Kim was a medically enhanced human with exceptional abilities among the few civilians in HVARM. He was a former Special Forces member with a great hand-to-hand -hand combat skills and B-grade shooting skills, essentially, a pathfinder. A week later, Quan and his colleagues were called to a higher unit for a regular test in a gravity control device using new technology discovered beyond the gate. Lee dong -hung refused to take the test, and Kim Jonah had already completed it, leaving only Quan. As Quan entered the device, Lee Chun-bong instructed him to set the maximum difficulty in order to sharpen his skills and potentially develop insensible sadism. This condition was a mental illness exclusive to immortals, causing them to lose all senses and derive a twisted pleasure from witnessing others' pain, as it reminded them of sensations they no longer experienced themselves. This test would determine Quan's resilience. To everyone's astonishment, Quan remained composed even when the device's speed was increased to 10G. Inside the device, Quan realized that he barely knew anything about his team. The pressure he experienced was similar to the training level of werewolves. A poorly trained immortal's body is close to that of a normal human, so such pressure would feel like a squeeze on all of their insides. As Quan endured the test, he was asked to recite the multiplication table and managed to answer the questions correctly. The team began to doubt whether Quan was on drugs and decided to send him for a drug test. After completing the training session, Quan felt a surge of energy, likely due to the combination of immortal and werewolf blood within him. As he exited the device, Kim Jonah handed Quan a handkerchief and told him he did well. The boss coldly instructed Quan to return to his workplace. Following the test, the team's attitude towards Quan changed. It seemed possible that he would be assigned some truly important cases. Panda handed Quan three folders, the first about the numbering of outsiders, the second about the types of potions, and the third about the rules for using the equipment and its structure. Quan was given four days to prepare, although he was told that others had taken only two or three days to learn the same material. In four days, there would be a test, and for every incorrect answer, Quan would have to spend one hour in the training room. In a flashback, it is revealed that Quan broke all the device records. The warden inquired how this was possible, and an employee explained that it was incredibly rare for an immortal to be born with such exceptional physical fitness. Quan's abilities were innate and extraordinary. The probationary period is called that because it is a time when trainees learn everything they need to know about working in an office and determine if it suits them or not. However, HVARM inundated Quan with a wealth of information, and for four days, his colleagues continually tested his readiness. After four days, the exam began, and Quan consistently got three questions wrong out of ten each day. HVARM had invested heavily in company equipment, providing various practice areas in the building such as a fitness room, a pain tolerance room, a visual acuity training room, sensory containment training, and hologram fights. Quan's long training sessions led even the instructors to regard him warily. Quan continued to study the material after his training sessions. His workload seemed excessive, but when his mother suggested he quit, Quan refused. This was the path he had chosen, and he believed it would lead him to his goal the fastest. Over the next two weeks, Quan started learning new information about HVARM. The external security team had three primary missions, disaster relief, prevention of special species terrorist attacks, and support for other teams. Quan's team, composed of purebloods, half-breeds, and medically enhanced humans, primarily provided support. One day, while on his way to the gym, Quan encountered his boss. They discussed Quan's high school days, including whether he was a bully or if he had been bullied. Quan replied that he had always tried to avoid conflict and help the weak. Seeing the determination in Quan's eyes, his boss challenged him to a boxing match, to which Quan agreed. The boss invites Quan to a boxing match at 3 o'clock in the training hall. 
He assigns Maiho as a backup to evaluate their work performance. Maiho asks Quan why he provoked the boss, and Quan replies that it was necessary to give the boss what he wanted. Quan tells Maiho that he wasn't offended, he simply wanted to test the best fighter of HRM, the S-ranked boss Li Junban. At 3 in the afternoon, everyone meets in the training hall. Without warming up, Quan starts attacking Li Jun with jabs and various combinations. However, Li is too agile for such strikes. A moment comes when Quan and Li simultaneously attack each other, and Quan's ears start ringing. He recalls the first time his mother took him to training when he was 15 years old. He had gotten angry over his mother's trivial words, and instead of school, she took him to the gym. Quan analyzes Li Jun's strike. It happened in a flash as they both swung their fists. The boss extended his hand and grabbed Quan by the forearm, breaking his arm bones and striking his head with his elbow. It was incredibly fast and precise. Lee taunts Quan, suggesting that he managed to land a hit despite being an irregular. Quan admits to himself that he wanted to test his boss's skills, but in reality, their fight is a duel between a werewolf and an immortal. Quan thought he could easily win, but this was too arrogant on his part. He takes a step back and asks the boss to attack him again. Quan and Lee begin sparring. Quan strikes at Lee, but to no avail. Lee tries to distract Quan with various questions, such as whether he joined the company for the money in an attempt to break his concentration. Quan remains serious and mentally stable, continuing to attack. Lee's movements are too fast, making it impossible to find an opening for a counterattack. Quan doesn't understand why Lee is faster than him, as Quan should be faster and stronger thanks to his werewolf power. Remembering his coach's words, Quan had only learned the basics, and there was no time for anything more. Additionally, Lee is a high-level pureblood. But that doesn't mean Quan intends to lose. During the sparring session, Lee asks questions that Quan doesn't answer. In turn, Quan asks Lee why he joined the company, and Lee replies that it was out of a sense of duty. In the end, Lee lands a heavy punch on Quan's face, and Quan lunges at Lee, attempting to hug him and break his bones. Unexpectedly, Quan collapses. One of the colleagues comments that this time, the killing of the trainee exceeded all expectations. The killing of trainees is a traditional ritual of the third external security team. It serves to humble the newcomer and show them the other side of the job. The boss says that Quan is a beast since he managed to break an arm and crack a rib. Lee asks for Quan to be taken to the medical center. Kim Jonah asks about Quan's final evaluation. Lee analyzes how Quan dodged his sudden attack, in which he concealed his energy and fell for a trick to deliver a counter-strike. Quan has hidden potential and a strong will with fighting spirit. Lee can't recall anyone with such talent across so many parameters. It feels as if Quan has been fighting since childhood, which is why he can defend himself so well. In reality, Lee wanted to use only one technique, sensory disruption, but ended up having to use three secret techniques against the Half-Blood. After all, the true talent is now lying on the mats behind him. Quan is trying to figure out why he blacked out during the sparring match with Lee. Naturally, Lee doesn't reveal his secret, but he asks Quan to write a report on the situation. Quan needs to determine the cause of his blackout and write a detailed report. Of course, no one shares any information with Quan, so he has to find out on his own. Meanwhile, at a conference, one of the departments presents a report. The analysis department does various work, tracking dangerous individuals and investigating unconfirmed theories and predictions. When it comes to surveillance, swift action is necessary when special species are involved in a person's disappearance, so analyzing situations is crucial. Quan is still pondering how Lee managed to defeat him in the sparring match. A colleague from another department continues their presentation, mentioning a project called Oracle. The project's essence lies in creating a system that predicts the future. However, the project has been shut down for now. Maiho raises her hand and says that predictors do exist, but they aren't like something out of a fantasy. All predictors say that the future is changeable, because it constantly changes, revealing any time period creates a new branch of future events. If you reveal a prophecy, it becomes a lie. But if only a few people know about it and don't spread the information, the future can come true. This theory was confirmed, and the Oracle project was based on it. However, the project failed. The problem lies in the human brain, thoughts in our heads don't always tell the truth. Many people were deceived by plausible but false facts, causing the project to suffer astronomical damage. If you believe what is true, there are countless absurd moments hidden within that truth. This is why misconceptions arise. Quan then recalls the words his friend told him at the training camp. The principle of hiding one's energy is confusion and perception. Thanks to their extraordinary sensory organs, immortals can block the information perceived by an opponent. Quan realizes how his boss managed to defeat him and rushes out of the room to his workplace. It's simple, the boss used a deceptive energy concealment technique. The boss was prepared in advance for Quan's attack, looking for the right moment to knock him out. This is something true masters, who have survived countless battles, can possess. Quan's heart races as he realizes this. He decides to test his theory on Lee by attacking him. With maximum concentration and blocking out all other sounds, Lee focuses solely on his opponent. He begins to sense Lee's energy everywhere. Lee asks Quan what he's doing, and Quan replies that he's submitting his homework report. Quan believes this approach will be much more interesting. 
Quan thought his answer would be much more accurate. Li replies that the answer is correct, but now someone has to clean up the mess Quan made. The workday comes to an end, and Li and Quan's colleagues go home. Li tells Quan to clean up everything he did and then he can be free. Kim Jong tells Li that Quan hid his energy and that's why he guessed the secret. Li asks about Quan's physical condition and Kim Jong answers that there are only a few people like Quan in the company. If Quan had been trained properly, he wouldn't have shown his carelessness, but he decided to test his theory in practice. The next day, Li tells Kim Jong to take Quan on a rank D assignment due to a shortage of personnel. Kim takes Quan with her and they go down to the sixth floor arsenal. Equipped, they head to the assignment. Arriving at their destination, they receive a report over the radio. 1. You see? Hotline, activation of contactless alarm system. 1. Alien number 1. You see, the probability of other aliens appearing. Hot, the speed of black hole openings. Line, aliens appearing one by one. Contactless alarm, a slightly noisy security system. Quan, seeing the hole, remembers an incident nine years ago involving the opening of huge gates. There was a similar hole in front of him, and he decided to destroy all the creatures that crawled out of the black hole. Today will mark the beginning of his journey. As they prepare, the black hole begins to expand. Kim asks for help, and the operator tells them to leave because a team will be sent to close the hole. However, there is a residential area 4 to 5 kilometers from the hole, and if our heroes don't do something now, aliens will pour out of the hole straight into the city. An alien appears from the hole, a blind dog. The operator orders them to retreat, but they don't listen. In last year's car accidents, fewer than a thousand people died. Thanks to the development of artificial intelligence and scientific technologies found in white holes, the number of victims has been reduced by a third. However, due to alien attacks, between 5,000 and 10,000 people die annually. People have managed to reduce the number of deaths from car accidents and diseases, but when it comes to aliens, nothing has changed. Immortals are extremely valuable personnel, and the company won't sacrifice them for thousands of citizens. Aliens begin to emerge from the hole, and our heroes start shooting, turning off the radio and disobeying orders. Kim expected about 10 monsters to come from the hole, so they took two guns and a few bullets. But since the black hole has taken on a wavy shape, at least a few hundred aliens will now emerge from it. What should they do now? More and more dogs begin to appear from the black hole. Quan asks Kim what the plan is, and she replies that Quan will be the bait. Shooting and defending themselves from the dogs, at one point, one of the dogs lunges at Quan. Kim covers him, killing the dog in the process. Being immortal, thanks to his sensory organs, Quan can feel the changes happening in Kim's body. Not knowing how medicated people are created, but the power of some significantly surpasses ordinary human standards. While Quan is shooting, Kim goes into hand-to-hand -hand combat. At this moment, they run out of ammunition, and Quan joins Kim. Kim incredibly quickly manages to dodge monster attacks. She calculates their positions and maintains a favorable position. Her rank combat skills are not for nothing. Distracted, a dog attacks Quan and bites his hand. Gathering his strength, he quickly kicks it away. San's plan goes into action. Quan strains his sensory organs and releases energy, recalling the survival rules in the wild taught by his teacher. Quan attracts the dogs, which begin to attack him. At some point, the dogs surround Quan, but remembering his technique, he starts to defend himself. He has to deal with all of them, as the lives of innocent people are at stake. At this moment, reinforcements arrive and shoot the remaining hounds. The arriving group conducts an analysis, sees that there are more than 200 hounds, and wonders how the two of them managed to cope. Kim Jong answers that it wasn't both of them, but Quan alone. After the mission, Kim and Quan report to their boss, who starts scolding them. They disobeyed orders. Kim takes all the blame, but Lee says that since she's a first-rank employee, her punishment will be dismissal. Nothing better than that. After this situation, a disciplinary committee will be convened. Lee sends Kim Jong home, and tomorrow she'll report to the inspection department. Quan's punishment is writing daily explanatory notes that he must place on Lee's desk. Upon returning to the office, rumors were already circulating about Quan and Kim. Kim Yohan tells Quan that interns' salaries are not reduced, nor are they fined, they are fired immediately. In this situation, Kim will have to shoulder all the responsibility. Although HWARM is under government control, it is still a commercial organization that needs to make a profit. Despite this, Quan and Kim saved people by breaking the rules. He made the right decision without any doubt. After the workday, Kim meets Quan and tells him, good job, you did well. At dinner, Quan talks to his mother about his day and how his colleague praised him. The next day, the disciplinary meeting begins. As Kim is being reprimanded for her disobedience, Quan enters. Quan stands by his words as they led to saving innocent civilians. Lee tries to help Quan and defend him, but the committee head tells her to be quiet. In the end, everything works out, and the head of the inspection department takes Quan away. Returning to the office, Quan is asked how everything went and if there was anything interesting. Quan says that the boss defended them as much as he could, but he didn't mention being called into the inspection department. Shortly after Quan's return, Lee and Kim arrived. Kim's punishment was a ban on participating in operations for 13 days. It was evident that something had happened, as the punishment itself wasn't particularly severe. And then, the routine resumed. 
Every morning, Quan wrote explanatory notes. As usual, Lee would pick on Quan, and Kim, in turn, began training him. From time to time, she also shared with him secrets of fighting against their boss. With each incorrectly written explanatory note, Lee began to unleash not only verbal attacks but also fists. And Quan adapted. There were no particular patterns in Lee's attacks, and even if it seemed like there were, it was a deception. This continued day after day until one day, Lee decided to ask Quan what Shim Mayan had told him. Shim Mayan was an assistant from the second external inspection team. A few days ago, he had invited Quan to join his team but added that it was just a joke. Suddenly, Shim appeared, and Lee, with all his strength and anger, punched him in the face. He asked Shim why he wanted to lure Quan to their team. But then, Park Pillow suddenly appeared. Park Pillow was the head of the external inspection team. As it turned out, it was Park's order to try to recruit Quan. Lee told Park and all the other departments that Quan was his intern, and no one would dare take him away. Park said they didn't have communism and there was freedom of choice, then turned to Quan, asking if he wanted to switch departments. Quan answered no. Park Pillow, age 30, had the nickname Royal Lord and was an elite immortal who rose to be the head of the inspection team. Pillow asked Quan why he wanted to stay, and Quan replied that there was still much to learn. Park and Shim left. After their departure, the assistant announced that there was a new assignment. Since there was no one else to send, Quan would take on the task. He needed to go to the airport and act as a human detector. At the airport, they needed to catch someone specific, a shapeshifter. A shapeshifter is a creature capable of changing its appearance. A skill allows one to assume the shape they remember. The assistant showed Quan a woman on a screen who worked as a freelance contractor, something like a mercenary. She passed on information and important documents, in other words, a spy. PWAT, a special task force to combat superpowers, had requested their help. Since the target could change appearance, only a werewolf could handle it, as they could detect the scent. Jian Jinam and Mai Ho, with Quan essentially acting as a guard for the newcomers, would join Quan's team. This meant that his combat skills were highly valued. Quan, Jian, and Mai received a briefing from Kan Hai Mo, the assistant of the analytical department. The location was Incheon Airport. To avoid arousing suspicion, they needed to dress casually. The meeting time was 10 a.m., and at the airport, members of PWAT would join them. Ahead of PWAT, Li Jiahe and Kan Hai Mo would be in the airport's situation room for communication and monitoring. Quan and Mai would patrol the fifth entrance. Jinam would sit in a tourist booth inside the airport and look for the target. PWAT also requested support from Real Guard, a security company. The members of Real Guard turned out to be werewolves who joined the mission. Quan asked Kan why Jinam had to sit in the tourist booth, and the answer was that they needed an immortal with exceptional senses. Once the target was captured, airport security would help control the situation. The briefing ended. The next day at the airport, a guy started hitting on Mai Ho, flirting with her and asking for her phone number. She told him she was married, but he didn't believe her. At that moment, Quan approached and introduced himself as her husband. Quan and Mai Ho checked their communication with the other teams and received a tip, a man who appeared to be around 30, wearing a dark blue shirt and light jeans. The reason John Jinam received special treatment was his keen insight. He reacted to a wide variety of stimuli, and his sensory ability was different. Water and stones were different for John, he could sense the difference in everything. At that moment, Real Guard encountered the man with an 80% match. PWAT was supposed to neutralize the target while the hero simply observed. Quan recalled his father's words, saying that an immortal's power is determined by their sensitivity level. Usually, such people have terrible personalities, and it's good that Quan wasn't like that. The difference between a pure blood and a half blood was evident even during orientation. There was a huge difference in speed and skills. At that moment, they stopped the identified target, and PWAT asked people to disperse. But then, a message came through the radio, where they sure there was only one target. An attack on the PWAT squad occurs from different sides. It turns out that all the attackers are telepaths. As it turns out, the enemy isn't just one, but a dozen. Two days before the operation, we are shown how Jinam, Mai Ho, and Quan are selected for the mission. Jian Jinam, despite the evaluations during orientation, is an amazing pureblood with direct lineage. Mai Ho, although a half-blood, is quite smart and composed. The last and strongest member is Quan, a friendly and powerful half-blood with excellent combat skills. Assistant Kan rushes to help the team, they need to check on Jinam, who is under fire from all sides. On the way, Kan notices a person who has been affected by his abilities. Tan orders Beta 3, Ai, Quan, to run to the left gates. Permission to engage has been granted, but they must not risk their own lives. Beta-1 reports that there are no casualties, except for a PWAT agent and two guards. Beta-2 reports that it's not a trap, and the enemy has begun their offensive. Judging by the fact that the scattered attackers have launched another attack, they want to intercept the shapeshifter. At some point, Jinam, thanks to his abilities, immobilizes one of the attackers and kills another. At that moment, in the parking lot, Quan catches up to an enemy. A dialogue occurs between them, revealing that the attacker has super strength abilities and transforms into a powerful mutant. At that moment, the superhuman attacks Quan, but Quan, dodging, grabs his arm. 
With one move, Quan sends him straight into a wall. Remembering the words that every force has a direction of movement and, by disrupting it, one can stop the enemy's attack. Quan knocks out the superhuman with an uppercut. As far as it is known, a shapeshifter can take the form of what they've seen but cannot transform into, for example, steel if they imitate it. Quan, seeing a backpack lying on the floor, approaches it. Taking out a lighter, he holds it up to the backpack and sees that it's the shapeshifter. He asks the shapeshifter to transform back into a human. After some time, the others arrive. Quan reports on the situation, stating that he knocked out the superhuman and the backpack turned out to be a shapeshifting girl. Li Jiayi, looking at the disabled superhuman, tells Quan that he just caught Na Du Pao, nicknamed Rhino and a third-degree fugitive. A reward has been announced for finding this criminal. A third-degree fugitive means they are associated with a terrorist group or have already killed someone. Quan tells Li Jiayi that they need to settle up, as the company, which doesn't match the contract, caught the target. Moreover, the team didn't use any equipment. Li Jiayi asks Quan, what is Quan's position? Quan replies that he is an intern. Returning to work, Li asks Quan why he tells everyone his name, does he want popularity? Quan replies that it has just become a habit. Li shares the case results. Nadu Pal, the criminal they arrested, is a member of the terrorist group Prometheus. Prometheus hired the shapeshifting girl. What she was carrying was a top secret of the psionic organization. Quan leaves, and Li asks him to write a report on his way out. Prometheus is a group of insane scientists. Like the god who brought fire to the world, they promise to bestow extraordinary powers upon anyone who desires it. At that moment, Quan is summoned and escorted to the director's office. The company director asks Quan to sit on the couch and inquires if he wants something as a reward for catching the criminal. Quan asks why he was called in, and the director replies that he is proud of Quan and wants to offer some kind of reward. What Quan wants is money, of course. He gives part of the bonus awarded by the company to his mother. It's nice to be able to spoil one's parents. After the airport incident, Quan's team receives several more assignments. In three months, Quan catches five particularly important criminals and manages to participate in the closure of ten black holes. Throughout this, Quan realizes one thing, Li hates going out. Li is also annoyed by Quan's reports. During training, Quan no longer gets knocked back after a couple of hand and leg strikes. Out of all the short fights between Quan and Li, Quan has yet to figure out his boss's secret. Four months after the airport incident, a corporate party takes place. Quan thought an immortal party would be completely different. In reality, it's just an ordinary feast held in an office cafeteria. Quan wants to see how he has changed since their first fight with his boss. He challenges Li to a real fight. Li agrees and sets a meeting in the training room in five minutes. When they meet in the room, the fight begins. However, Quan, still unable to decipher Li's secret, is knocked out. The higher-ups receive dossiers on all the company's newcomers. The director ponders how Quan managed to get into the third external security team. Concluding that Quan's skills are insufficient, the director decides to fire him. Quan is given an evaluation of his performance, and his colleagues tell him that he's under close scrutiny. If he doesn't show outstanding results, he'll be the first to be fired from the company. An announcement is made over the loudspeaker, calling all interns to gather in the training room. By combining the test results and staff evaluations, the management team will determine who will stay at H. Varum Company. Colleagues from another department mock Quan, calling him the number one candidate for dismissal. The test begins, and it involves sparring with each other. Jinum chooses Quan as his opponent. During the sparring, Jinum's attacks miss Quan, while Quan counterattacks precisely. Recalling all the tests Quan has taken, his performance was worthy of an S rank. Quan had to hide some of his superpowers so that no one would discover the werewolf blood running through his veins. If he wanted to, he could outperform anyone in the company in an instant. From this point on, Quan will stop suppressing his power and will give it his all. Quan's case is considered non-standard, in S. After the testing, Lai begins to scold Quan for knocking out Jinam's front teeth and cracking Mai Ho's teeth. Quan starts to snap back at his bus, but it all ends abruptly, Quan goes home. On the street, a car pulls up to Quan. The man in the car introduces himself as Don Chal and offers to give Quan a ride home. Don Chal tells Quan that there is a project he is working on, and there is a vacant position within it. He wants Quan to take the spot, allowing him to work at the company and volunteer in his free time. After a training period, Quan becomes a third-rank employee. He gains access to a larger number of working documents on the intranet, and his salary increases. The intranet is an internal network, typically owned by a private individual, government, or large company. Quan also moves into the company's building, located just five minutes away from work. At the same time, his team has less work to do. In a flashback, Quan asks Kim why their team has no work achievements. She replies that they haven't really accomplished anything. Quan mentions closing black holes and catching important criminals, but as they were only providing support, it wasn't counted. Moreover, the higher-ups dislike Lai, so they receive less work. Quan asks if the team can stick together despite the lack of achievements, and Kim replies that they can, as the assistant manager takes on side work meant for other teams and completes it. A message arrives in the messenger from Lai, saying that there will be a team dinner at Don Hun's house that evening. Don Hun's house is a meeting room for gatherings outside of work. 
Lai begins his presentation, showing the team an axon stone, a material found in a hole. The stone serves as a storage for aura, a type of energy emitted by users of abilities, yet not connected to any of them. One can store their aura in the stone to alter the energy. The axon stone will usher in a new era of energy sources. All stones have the same capacity, with the highest publicly disclosed rank being AA. 1D rank axon stone can power a flight from Incheon to New York. The third team's task is to find all axon stones. Two days later, Quan and Kim are shown being pursued by an unknown person. They chase after him, claiming it's a restricted area, and end up falling into the hole. The operation to search for axon stones begins. Somewhere in a mine, a special forces squad finds the axon stones and starts transporting them. Lai senses that everything is going smoothly, and now Don Hun's plan should be successful as well. Chasing the unknown man, Quan recalls Don Hun's words. About a kilometer from the White Hole, a special species suspected of robbery resides. They need to pursue him and then accidentally enter the White Hole. The special forces have permission to pass in extraordinary situations, so regardless of everything, they must enter. The sensation of passing through the White Hole is awful, dizziness, and nausea. Emerging from the hole, Kim and Quan encounter two men resembling telepathic guards. Quan says they are from the Immortal Special Forces and are pursuing a criminal who also entered the hole. Quan is told they were the only ones who entered the hole. Quan asks if they are covering for the criminal because he is a member of the special species. From this moment on, the Immortal Species forces will possess part of the team's authority in the plan to capture the special species criminal. Suppression plan execution will follow if cooperation is refused and the reaction is negative. One of the men, igniting a fire, attempts to attack Quan, but Quan throws a smoke grenade and, carrying a stun Kim, tries to escape. Meanwhile, the stone transportation takes place. At the briefing, Lai says he will be the only one officially going for support. He and the main strike force will support the transportation of the Axon stones. And when a certain incident occurs, Kim and Quan will need to steal several boxes of stones. Lai's mage amulet begins to vibrate around his neck. The amulet sends a signal when a similar amulet is within a certain distance. If the signal is on, it means Kim and Quan have managed to infiltrate the hole. On the way, the convoy encounters aliens, orcs. Permission to use firearms is granted, and a shootout begins. At the same time, Quan starts fighting a shark worm. There are too many things to be amazed by. It takes 45 minutes to properly stand, hear, walk, and feel things again when entering another world for the first time. Even immortals need half an hour to rehabilitate after passing through the hole. Kim muses that a well-executed job would involve destroying telepaths within two days, but Quan managed everything with a smoke grenade. Now he is fighting against an invader he has seen for the first time. How much more will he surprise them? One day has passed since entering the other world. Quan suggests to Sam to rest a little in a small cave behind a hill. The plan for Quan and Kim was to track and be on standby. They needed to follow the squads transporting the Axon stones and predict which route they would take. They had to seize the opportunity to take the stones if an incident occurred. Sitting by the campfire, Quan tells Kim that Lai sometimes seems crazy. Kim agrees and says that it's not just sometimes, but very often. On the fourth day after entering the other world, Quan starts to develop an attachment to Kim. They haven't seen the main forces during this time, and Quan has spent too much time alone with Kim. Now he wonders why Kim works for the company if she isn't even immortal. Quan asks Kim the reason for working at the company, to which she replies, revenge. They fall asleep but wake up due to sudden anxiety, someone is approaching their cave. Kim asks how many there are, and the answer is, two. Entering the cave, the two strangers notice Kim and aim their weapons at her. As they ask questions, Quan attacks them from cover. Switching places, they notice the strangers had radios, an automatic rifle, and a sniper rifle. At gunpoint, Quan asks who they are and what they're doing here. They reply that they just wanted to make some money and kill a couple of invaders. Remembering Lai's words about the incident, these are not just freelancers. Quan suggests Kim change the plan. Meanwhile, the Prometheus group also comes for the Axon Stones. Baby Pildu is the name of the terrorist. He says that if they give him the stones, he will only kill half of them. A verbal altercation begins, and at this moment, an unknown woman from the telepath side appears. She says there is no safe way to escape, so they must surrender. Lai believes that the enemies know everything, from their numbers to their destination. Information has leaked, and there must be someone acting as a spy. Over the radio, they transmit Jake's code. However, the opposite happens, a telepath is shot from a sniper rifle. The unknown woman is confused, while Lai is pleased. It was Quan and Kim. Kim shoots the telepath in the leg with a precise shot and aims at the woman. A few hours before the Prometheus attack, Quan and Kim find a suitable position for surveillance, but the invaders occupy it. Quan quickly pins one to the ground with a swift blow, while he decapitates the other. Leaving the cave, Quan doesn't understand what's happening. A mixed squad of a sniper telepath and an immortal is the fifth one they've encountered. Kim tells him that all sniper positions have been discovered. After some time, when Jake's code is heard, Kim tells Quan that they're starting. She takes out her sniper rifle, which she named Katie Hippo. At the moment, the unknown woman doesn't understand who took over the sniper position. A 
the Special Forces squad takes up positions and begins firing at the enemies. The woman calls on the radio to execute Code Ralph, but the radio is with Quan. She orders to find the source of the signal and send BB number 7 there. Meanwhile, Lai provokes an attack from Baby Pildu on himself. Kim tells Quan to change position, but at that moment, three enemies find them. One of the enemies asks Quan about his relationship with Kim, to which Quan replies, the kind where he carries her on his back. The man attacks Quan, Quan dodges, but in the heat of the moment, he gets wounded. A claw emerges from the man's elbow and sinks into Quan. Kim starts shooting at the man with her sniper rifle, drawing fire to herself, while Quan tries to strike him. Something happens, BB number 7 turns into a werewolf. With a light movement, he throws Quan away. Twisted teeth and patches of missing fur, that's what an artificially created werewolf, a half-blood, looks like. Quan tells Kim to step back and take the sniper position. Thanks to the heightened senses of an immortal, Quan could confidently say that this guy, artificially created by mixing the blood of different races, was now nothing more than a deranged and hungry monster, a creature created by the hands of human invaders. The fight with the werewolf begins. Quan dodges, saying that was close. In the heat of the battle, the werewolf displays its shape-shifting ability. This ability allows it to change the strength of its bones. Quan suspected that BB-7 was a half-blood outcast. The werewolf not only has the shape-shifting form but also the endurance of a shapeshifter. These skills are handy, but there is an ability that Quan learned on his own. Quan, using hidden energy, breaks through the werewolf's defense. With one strike, the bone protection is broken and an open wound appears. Concentrating his senses, Quan focuses on a single object to predict its next actions, observing only its gestures or eye movements. With the final blow, he knocks out the werewolf and exhales. At that moment, two remaining telepaths start to approach him. But Quan, tilting his head, allows Kim to shoot one of them right in the head. The other one gets a mega hit from Quan. The telepath utters, well, Teidu, Haina, and at that moment, Kim shoots him. She tells Quan that it was a death spell. Kim informs Quan that it's time to go since Prometheus has retreated. One of the Special Forces squad members asks Lai, who eliminated Prometheus' snipers. He replies that it was Quan and Kim, his subordinates. In any case, Quan and Kim saved them and should, therefore, receive high effectiveness scores. The next day, Quan reflects on the fact that if they had managed to steal the Axon stones, the company would have kept it a secret. However, they didn't, and the company also found out they were there. Quan simply won't tell what happened in the afterlife. Quan is told that nothing special happened, there were a couple of complaints from associations, but everything was fine. The Sionic decided to give a larger share of the stone because the mission would have failed if not for Kim and Quan. In other words, what they did was praiseworthy and the shares were just a bonus. At this moment, Kim Jossok, the head of the bodyguard researcher team, enters the third team's office. He thanks Quan and hands him a bullet slicing knife. This knife is worth at least tens of thousands of dollars. Quan and Kim get a promotion. Dan Han asks Quan to write a report on what happened. As Quan wrote the report, he pondered, the reason the ambush failed was that he and Sam just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Some people might have survived if everything had gone according to plan, but the situation would have been completely different. Considering the whole situation, there was no reason to rejoice. There was only one reason this could have happened, a data leak. A week later, we see the third team drinking at a snack bar. Lai, getting drunk, talks about the need to find the mole. Quan replies that they need to report to their superiors, but Lai says they won't listen. Terrorist organizations have changed these days. They have savings companies. After the feast, Quan goes home. At that moment, his father calls him, and they chat on the phone about unrelated topics. After that, Quan calls Lai and tries to talk about the traitor. The first hypothesis, the traitor is a big shot and beyond the reach of H. Wareham's internal inspection group. The second hypothesis, the traitor is not connected to Prometheus. If he had been loyal to Prometheus, the government would have done something about it, even if he had been higher in rank. The third hypothesis, the traitor works only with Prometheus. The reason to cooperate with Prometheus without being a government official. The fourth hypothesis, the traitor's goal is money. Quan asks Lai about the management who wants to hide their money. Is there a chance that a terrorist organization like Prometheus is hiding money for them, and in return, they can boldly declare themselves a terrorist organization? At that moment, Quan bursts into the bar where Lai and Don Hun are sitting. Quan proposes a plan, why not rob the traitor's vault? Lai suggests meeting in the conference room to discuss. We are shown a bank where a robbery is taking place. A masked criminal bursts in and shoots a security guard. A second security guard, unsheathing his claws, attacks the criminal but is hit and knocked out. The criminal approaches the cashier and presses the backup button. The criminal tells everyone to lie down and not move. A scene is shown in which Don Hun explains that the second largest financial group is a private loan shark and bank. They were created by the terrorist organization Prometheus. Quan suggests robbing them. However, the normal way would be to identify the source of income and track the turnover using the Financial Inspection Commission. Nevertheless, there are no guarantees that the team can succeed in this way, and there is no time for that. Lai asks Quan why he is so obsessed with the trader. Quan replies that when a company deprives an employee of their salary, it is robbery. 
and when they were deprived of axon stones according to the plan, it was also a robbery. Quan is an honest man, and he asked himself what he could do for his teammates who were robbed by the company. The plan was to rob banks twice in one day. Quan, hiding behind a mask, takes the money and leaves. Then, Kim picks him up. Lai tries to get the management's approval to carry out the plan. They need to rob safes in Hapjian, Suyu, and Gangnam. And, of course, they will ensure that there are no civilian casualties. After some time, one of the superiors reads the news that two banks have been successfully robbed, which means the plan worked. The third team congratulates each other on a successful operation, but it's too early to relax, there's one more thing to do. The next morning, the anti-corruption squad arrives at the company office. They interrogate Lai, but they don't learn anything new. Finally, Lai asks Quan to do the homework. The management ordered an internal investigation into corruption. Working in this field often involves taking risky and illegal actions. Delving into the details could lead to arrest. If you're lucky, you'll either be fired or suspended from work. If not, there's a chance you'll become a criminal. It's no coincidence that banks were robbed to catch the traitor, and the next day, Lai and the rest of the team find themselves under investigation. Quan asks what will happen to him. He is told that he simply needs to pretend he knows nothing. Quan's plan was to catch the traitor, but he ultimately put his teammates in a dire situation. Lai's words about homework refer to robbing the main money and saves bank building. At this moment, Lai is being interrogated. He is asked to admit to part of the charges so that an agreement can be reached later. Otherwise, he faces 10 years in prison. Lai asks who ordered the investigation. The interrogator tells him that much is based on circumstantial evidence, and there are things even the CEO doesn't know. In time, Quang goes to the company director and asks for a favor. The director says that in two days, there will be a trial test for the third members of the external security group, and Quang will be excluded. He has 48 hours left, but he wants to rob the bank without any support in that time frame and bring the traitor to justice. The director gives the green light for the operation but without any support. After Quan leaves, the assistant tells the director that Quan won't be able to do it. The director responds that one should never underestimate people. Afterward, Quan sends Mai Ho a message asking to meet on the rooftop. He tells her that he is behind the robberies. He shows her the authorization to carry out the plan, signed by the director himself. The target is the main location of money and save. Quan asks for Mai Ho's help, saying he needs her. Mai Ho leaves, but Quan stops her. There will be one more person on the team, the one who taught Quan to act like a real robber when he robbed the first two establishments. Money and save is protected by private security. Meanwhile, PWAT is responsible for the surrounding districts. There's no concern about civilian interference. Mai Ho, showing the plan, asks Quan to memorize the terrain and names of each district, as she will give orders accordingly. As he leaves, Quan tosses Mai Ho a cocktail potion. The cocktail potion C8, also known as popcorn, slightly enhances physical abilities, making a person more perceptive and energetic. Maiho says Quan defeated Jenny Kinam in the blink of an eye, scored the highest points in every test, excelled in executing plans, and has sharp vision. Quan has impressive skills. Quan begins the attack on the bank, while Maiho coordinates him. Their goal is to create chaos in order to hide explosives behind the safe. Mai Ho, coordinating Quan, tells him about the peculiarities of each district. Later, Quan is attacked by three Special Forces soldiers who corner him. At that moment, Quan jumps on the wall and, with the Special Forces losing sight of him, he performs a deceptive maneuver, shooting them from the wall. One of the soldiers transforms into a werewolf and attacks Quan. Quan, without hesitation, grabs him and throws him at another. PWAT comes to the rescue and it's time for Quan to retreat. On the way, Mai tells him where to go. A chase ensues after Quan, but he hides behind a car and throws it at the police. At that moment, one of the officers shoots a grenade launcher at Quan. This was all a diversion while the people from his squad made a hole in the bank's wall. The RPG blast rips Quan's arm off. The Special Forces squad starts approaching Quan, but suddenly a man with a katana emerges from the hole made by the grenade launcher. At that moment, a werewolf attacks Mai Ho. She is thrown back by the impact. The werewolf says he has placed another person in the right spot where everything would be visible and where he would have information. This person should not be within reach. Also, there are several high rises in the area, and knowing this fact, the possible options have narrowed. It's strange that Mai Ho couldn't sense his approach. The attack must have been from a blind spot. At the other end of the district, the man with the katana impales Quan. Quan couldn't sense the approach from behind as the man hit his footsteps. This man is immortal. This immortal is one of the elite members of the security group Prometheus. A few days ago, Quan asks the director's secretary for a report. Quan tries to find out from him who the traitor is since the secretary knows this information. Quan asks for a favor, apparently to give permission to proceed for the operation. The secretary considers Quan a rare type, one that can be seen among those who have just entered society. Quan is innocent and knows only how to be straightforward, just like a child. During the fight between Mai Ho and the werewolf, the secretary appears on the roof. The werewolf changes his target and starts attacking him, but the secretary dodges. With a laser wire, the secretary slices the werewolf's arm off, and after a few harsh words towards him, the laser wire does its job, cutting the werewolf's body in two. The secretary asks if Mai Ho is injured. 
Maiho says she understands it was the general director's appointment. The secretary replies that it wasn't, someone else asked for help. At the same moment, the elite fighter tries to remove Quan's mask, but we see that Quan managed to hide a tablet in his mouth before the explosion. The official name is HCS-3, a high-calorie bomb. Its effects include dulling pain, increasing strength threefold, and self-repair. Suddenly, Quan's arm rapidly regrows. He grabs the fighter with both hands, rips his arms off, and kicks him aside. PWAT stares at Quan in fear, and Quan asks them, who's next? 